everyone. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for everyone being here today. I'm Marlene Lee Kang. I am the administrative director of the Field Center here at Baruch. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for being here and tell you just a little bit about the Field Center before we move on to today's event. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Field Center, we're located here in this building on the second floor. And we offer uh, a few sectors of opportunities for faculty, for students, and the community. Um, like today's event, this is a Field Center event uh, sponsored by the Field Center. And we do events like this and other different opportunities for the community, students, and faculty for learning opportunities, um, ways for you to uh, network, uh, gain different educational uh, skills and just a myriad of um, different ways that we can engage with each other. Uh, we also have uh, Maker Hub, which is our technology team offered here at Baruch for Baruch students. Um, they offer workshops in technology training, prototyping, they do 3D printing, uh, Arduino, um, and electronic uh, workshops. And so we have those services also coming out of the Field Center. CUNY Startups is also going to be, um, uh, be uh, located in the Field Center as well. Coming fall, we will, they will have a place with us. And so that is where we offer hackathons, accelerators, and different opportunities in learning for all of CUNY students. And then last but not least, uh, the Small Business Development Center, which is uh, free counseling, advice, and just overall uh, a place for you to go to bounce those ideas for new businesses, new businesses for um, students and the community, and it's open to everyone. So I would like to invite you to stop by, say hello, see what we have going on. And even if you just want to check it out, see what's going on down there, um, we have new and exciting things happening, and especially coming next fall. This is our last event for this uh, academic year. So come next fall, I hope to see a lot of you there um, for our um, event today um, to welcome and introduce our main speaker is the Academic Director of the Field Center, Scott Newbert. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, again, I'd like to welcome everybody here as well today, and uh, thanks so much for coming. It's great to see such a big uh, group, especially uh, towards the end of the semester where I know a lot of you have other things that you could be spending your time on, so we're glad to uh, co-opt you uh, this afternoon for today's event. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Bill Davis. Uh, Bill is the Managing Director at LGDJ Capital, uh, LGDJ Cayman Fund. Um, he's a former Baruch student, so we're happy to uh, always invite people, uh, former students of ours, back here to campus to tell us what they've been up to. Uh, LDJ Capital is a multifamily office that invests and manages um, investments for partners and clients in a lot of traditional industries, but most recently, and, and the reason that we're all here today, uh, in digital assets such as cryptocurrency, uh, as well as blockchain firms through ICOs. Uh, Bill has over 15 years of leadership experience in this space. Uh, he's worked for dozens of companies involved in uh, blockchain, crypto, mobile payments, and big data. Uh, in the process, he's raised millions of dollars for fintech and blockchain companies, and he's also closed major deals with them and other large Fortune 500s interested in the space, such as Visa, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, Bill Sutz sits on a uh, half dozen uh, boards in this space as well for a variety of mobile payment, blockchain, and uh, tech firms. Um, and prior to joining LDJ, Bill held a number of C-level and director positions uh, for Fortune 500s and startup fintech companies all across the globe. Uh, so, if anybody knows about this stuff, it's Bill, so we're super uh, excited to have him here. And then as a, as a final uh, interesting tidbit, uh, when not immersed in the world of fintech, uh, Bill can be found writing recording music uh, and also mentoring urban athletes and artists throughout uh, the New York City area, uh, as well as Miami. Uh, so uh, a really uh, interesting person, uh, multifaceted background, former Baruch student, so we're really happy to have him today. Uh, so please give, me a war uh, give a warm round of applause to Bill. Wow, wow, what an introduction. <laughs> I appreciate that. But today, this event is not about me, it is about you. Blockchain, as everyone is probably aware, has become the buzzword in, in, in New York City, around the world. And I am very, very, very blessed to have an incredible panel to talk to you about different aspects of blockchain. And, but before we do that, we're gonna have a small format 
with a short presentation by two gentlemen, uh, Wei Ho and Shabab. I'm going to give you a little background about me, how I got here, what my journey was, and then uh, we'll have some formal questions for the panel, and then we'll turn the floor over to you guys. So Wei Ho, Wei Ho and Shabab, can we uh, get started and, and, and talk a little bit about blockchain? Hi everyone, um, my name is Weho. I'm currently a, um, a student at Baruch College. And this presentation is basically going to be giving you guys an outline of blockchain's uh, impact in the future as well as its impact on certain industries. Ultimately, its implications for the future to come. So now to really understand what blockchain has to offer in terms of future impacts, we really need to first start off by understanding the grounds of blockchain and what blockchain is. So now, what is blockchain? Blockchain is a decentralized, mutually distributed ledger that is embedded within a global network of computers that, is, that utilizes blockchain technology as a way to manage a shared database. And now, one of the things that makes blockchain revolutionary is the fact that blockchain is ultimately decentralized. And what that means is that instead of having information centralized on one server controlled by a few admins, blockchain decentralizes that information and spreads it across different nodes, across different computers within the network, so different people can have it, which ultimately translates to total transparency in terms of information and records. So basically what I like to call is I like to call it sort of a Google Docs of databases, except for the fact that it records specific transactions within a specific time. So now with decentralization, the impact to that is securitization and increased security of records because the way that blockchain functions is the fact that different blocks or nodes are distributed across different computers and in order for information and transactions to be validated, each one of those nodes needs to create, sort of agree with each other on the information being transported across the blockchain, which is called a consensus. And now with that, the, the decentralization as well as increased securitization, blockchain offers many impacts to the world. Uh, and one of the impacts that it offers sort of high speed and sort of high security embedded in blockchain, it can sort of, all of us know that blockchain has the ability to sort of trans, transform our monetary system. But not, what, the thing that not many people pay attention to is blockchain's impact on sort of third party intermediaries within not only the financial industry, but across every industry that is sort of around the globe. And now the impact that blockchain might have on the job market for a lot of your students here is that it might shrink certain jobs, but in translation to that can create a lot of new jobs that requires sort of new skills of the interaction of blockchain ultimately. And now sort of the industries that we've selected that might be um, impacted the most are the financial industry, the healthcare industry, the gambling industry, the supply chain industry, as well as the real estate industry. And the reason for that is that each one of these industries has a lot of different data that is sort of very dispersed right now. And the problem right now that we're having as a world is the fact that we are unable to sort of match those data up with each other because of, of the de of, because a lot of um, mismatch and organization that's happening. But then blockchain is able to sort of consolidate all of this data through its securitization and through the blocks and nodes through each network and sort of transform the system as a whole. So now, before we begin, like the thing that you guys, each and every one of you need to understand about blockchain is that right now, 2018 is sort of known as the year of ICOs. And what a ICO is, is an initial coin offering. It is a fundraising mechanism in which um, uh, blockchain companies sell their tokens, quote unquote, sell their tokens to investors who are willing to donate money in exchange. And now, a, a lot of people have been questioning ICOs versus IPOs, and the primary difference to that is during an ICO, investors within an ICO don't get, um, don't get equity um, ownership within the company, but instead they get sort of tokens. And what those tokens do in comparison to tra traditional stocks and traditional e equities is that the health or the price of tokens is not increased because of the health of the company, but ultimately increased by the utilization of those tokens, which sort of uh, creates a differenti differentiation in, sort of, uh, in prices of tokens versus equities. And also, the thing that makes ICOs very unique to sort of the landscape right now is that you don't need to be an accredited investor in a sense to invest in ICOs. And then also, it's executed mainly through crowdfunding, which is a process in which multiple different individuals' funds, such as venture capitals, angels, and, or individual investors, get together to sort of donate that money and to sort of uh, launch the token sale. 
And uh, we did a little bit of, uh, we did uh, some studies about the ICO performance currently happening in the past year, 2017, and we raised the total, uh, the entire ICO industry across the globe raised a total of about $3.8 billion uh, through 210 ICOs happening in 2017. But the thing about this is that this data from 2017 is very, um, uh, it's different based on each website you look at, but the one that we used was the ICO tracker on the internet. So now the thing that, the reason that we decided to use that statistic is so we can, now, now here's a current look of how we're performing right now currently in 2018, the ICO process. And, after you, and as you guys can see here, uh, 183 ICOs have already been done currently in this year. And then the significance of this is that the amount of money that has been raised through the ICO process this year has surpassed $3.8 billion, which shows that we're going into a completely new trajectory in terms of ICO and crowdfunding. And now the reason that we decided to use this data so we can project out the expected number uh, uh, the expected number of ICOs that's going to be happening in 2018 as well as the expected amount of money that we're thinking that is going to be raised as a result of ICO funding. So it, the way that we decided to model this out is sort of in 2017 to uh, January to December 2017, there has been a 7,000% increase in terms of the money raised from the beginning to the end of the year. And now like our model takes this growth rate, but then we're saying that right, like that growth rate is very significant. So we want to keep our assumptions conservative, but at the same time, it is cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency prices are hyper volatile. So we decided to sort of sh shorten that percentage of growth down to 3,500% growth. And at the end of the day, we're saying that we project a bullish projection of $53 billion will be raised by the end of the year around with the number of 700 ICOs. And, but then in a the beer case, if that doesn't happen, we just decided to take the amount of money raised from, from January to April, project that out four months to 12 months. In a, bullish, in a bearish case, we'll probably raise around $23 billion, which is also surpassed last year's complete uh, fundraising. So now, with fundraising always comes services that helps facilitate these different ICOs. And now, right now within the industry, this, this industry is not particularly developed yet because of like, sort of the uh, musky regulations which we're dealing with right now. So the way that we decided to model this out is by utilizing the investment banking transaction fees that are certainly currently happening with like, equity offerings, so that, uh, which means that sort of um, the fees that banks usually take for large transactions is probably 1%, uh, around the 1% area. So by applying this down, we arrived at a total market cap of around $804 million industry in a bullish case and a uh, $349 million industry in a bearish case. And now with the rise of blockchain, obviously comes other applications that hops up. And we're saying that what is next is the hash graph. And what a hash graph is, is it is an alternative form of distributed ledger technology that utilizes the same uh, uh, mechanisms that blockchain uses. However, it is a consensus protocol that is built around the idea of gossip. And what gossip is, is the fact that it is the fact that uh, nodes are spread across information of different systems, just like the blockchain. However, the way that information is spread throughout each application is different. For example, in blockchain, you spread information in the linear notion across each node within a system or a network. However, in Hashgraph, the way that you specifically uh, distribute information is, is sort of um, uh, you metasize the information. In fact, the nodes aren't traveled from one, two, three, four. However, nodes are traveled from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So then you duplicate the number of information, which increases the amount of speed that is embedded within Hashgraph. And now, gossip protocol is also utilized to sort of increase securitization because of the multiple different nodes and the scaling mechanisms within Hashgraph. However, a lot of people, when it comes to Hashgraph, a lot of people ask the question of, will it be a competitor to blockchain? And we're saying that right now, the question is, um, it really depends. Because in a private network where all different computers and networks are known within the system, Hashgraph has been proven to be faster at executing transactions in blockchain. However, in a public network where, network, uh, where computers and entities are unknown, they're, they tend to be slower at executing those transactions and is currently in the process of being tested. So in our opinion, we're saying that we don't think hashtag, uh, Hashgraph is going, to, uh, is going to sort of directly compete with blockchain, but in the sa same time, they can coexist because they fix up for each other's strengths and weaknesses. So with that said, I'm going to pass it on to um, my uh, Shabab. Hello, everyone. My name is Shabab. I'm also an intern at LDJ, and I'm a student at Baruch. So the first topic I'm going to talk to you guys about is ICO fraud. 
And to start off, I want to uh, show you data of the number of ICOs since 2016. And since 2016, we've seen enormous growth in the number of ICOs. From 2016 to 2017, ICOs grew from 43 ICOs in 2016 to 210 in 2017. And we're creeping up on that number already in 2018. And there's a projected number of over 600 ICOs that we can, can expect in 2018. And with all these ICOs happening, there's a lot more money being raised. So already in 2018, we've passed the number of, the amount of money generated in ICOs. And the projected amount of money that's supposed to be raised in 2018 should surpass $20 billion. So with more money comes more problems. And with the ICO space, people are seeing that they're becoming victim of fraud because ICOs are coming out, they're, they're gaining traction, and then investors invest their money, but then the company leaves with that money. So while nations have tried to create some sort of regulation in this market, we're far from that, as there aren't concrete rules in this market. The US has recently subpoenaed 80 companies to learn more about their business plan and their ICOs. And then you have other countries such as Estonia, Japan, Malta, who are more lenient and let their citizens invest in ICOs. So what is the, the solution to this problem? The solution is education of the investors. Investors need to do their due diligence into the white paper, the team, the social media, the GitHub, and the ICO token distribution. So first off, the white paper. The white paper is a method for companies to sh show their business platform, their product, their plans and goals, the reasons behind creating the product, a roadmap, and the tokenomics of their project. So when looking at the white paper, think to yourself, is decentralization really necessary? Can this project be put through with a centralized manner, which would be more efficient? Does the white paper have buzzwords that add no value to it. Are there any mistakes in that white paper? Although, if the company is foreign based, you may expect some mis grammatical mistakes, so you should let that go. And then, is the white paper completely copied from some other source? Does the white paper lay out their goals for the future? And does the white paper make any outrageous claims like you're guaranteed to make a profit in a matter of months? Next, you have the team and advisor, advis, advisors that create the company. So think about this. Is the team anonymous? Because some people like their anonymity. They don't want their name out there. But do they have a good standing in Bitcoin forum and Reddit? Does the team have experience in the industry? Whether it be software experience or experience ho holding director positions in big companies? And then what value do advisors add to the platform? Next, you have the social media. And in the age of social media, this platform could easily be reached to their audience. And the easiest way to reach their audience is through a telegram. Does the company have a telegram? That should be their easiest way to reach out to their audience. If they don't, that should stand out. Is their website well put? Does it have the links to all their team members' LinkedIn's? Does it have a link to their white paper? Next, you have the GitHub. GitHub is where coders and companies could put the code for their programs. And if a company is working hard on their project, you could expect their code to be there. However, sometimes companies will put random updates to their readme and make it seem like they're constantly updating their project. So that shouldn't count towards the project. Next, you have the token distribution. The token distribution is how the company divides up all the generated tokens among all parties involved in the ICO. So a company retaining most of its tokens should be a red flag, because if they receive those tokens and just leave with all the money after selling them at exchanges, you can't trust that platform. 
So all in all, the best way to avoid ICO fraud is by educating yourselves into doing research into those companies. So the next topic I want to talk to you guys about is the analysis of ICOs. So LDJ has been an advisor or an investor to hundreds of ICOs, and the problem with that was a few ICOs didn't perform as well as they should have, and LDJ is creating a better system to analyze these ICOs. My role specifically was to create this algorithm that makes it easy for, easier for LDJ to just input data into that algorithm and receive a grading system for that. So I started off with quantitative variables, but ICOs don't have that many quantitative variables. Some variables that should be there that aren't are customer acquisition, sales revenue, returns on assets, or profit margin. But what was available was the token price, token distribution, and hard and soft cap. So what I did with those variables was gather the, gather the data for those variables from the top 30 ICOs based on returns on investments. This graph shows the ICO price versus return on investments since ICO for those top 30 companies. This next graph shows ICO market cap and total market cap ratio versus ROI since ICO. And then this one shows percent of tokens sold versus ROI since ICO. What all those graphs had in common was there was no correlation. And for that reason, I couldn't use one in individual variable to predict whether an ICO would be successful. So I employed the use of other variables as well, qualitative variables. So these qualitative variables included whether or not there was a prototype or an MVP, which stands for minimal viable product, the experience the team had, and whether they had a GitHub or not. So the methodology behind this algorithm was I gathered all the data for, for those variables from the top 30 ICOs based on ROI. I then took the quantitative variables and checked for normality because I wanted to use the mean and the standard deviation to create ranges for which an ICO could get a certain score based on that variable but there, there, there wasn't any normality because there were so many outliers. So I employed the use of the median and interquartile ranges because those are resistant to outliers. So then, based on that, I gave certain values to each variable. Let's say if a team was very experienced, they should receive a higher grade and whether they weren't experienced, they wouldn't get any points for that <coughs> score. So with every variable receiving evaluation, I took the average of every variable and gave each company a score. So now we're going to look at the application of this algorithm towards the top 30 coins. So IOTA's number one, it received a grade of 94.55%. But as you could see, not all 30 are on here. That's because some of them had their flaws starting off. Some were anonymous, so I couldn't put a score in for their technological experience or their, see, uh, their business experience because they're anonymous and I have no data for that. Next you have the application of the equation for the ICOs that garnered the most amount of money in 2017. HDAC received over $250,000 in their ICO, $250 million in their ICO, and it got a score of 44.23. It hasn't been doing, doing well. It hasn't even re reached exchanges yet. So it goes to show that you should be doing your research behind these companies because some of them just try to gain investors without proper, sorry, losing my words. All right, so in conclusion, after doing all this research into all these ICOs, I noticed one particular thing that most of the successful ones had in common, 
they had a great team behind them. So when looking into ICOs, look for the team first. Thank you. Thank you guys, we appreciate that. Weho and Shabab, my interns, they tolerated me for an entire session, my pontification, my stress, my absenteeism, et cetera. So I really appreciate them, they did a great job. Um, if we don't mind, can I have the panel take some chairs and, and, and we'll get that started in a moment. In the meantime, I'll give you a little bit about my personal journey and why Baruch is important to me. Um, and very briefly, um, in the era that uh, uh, I was a teenager, um, it was less prosperous times in New York City. And I had gotten kicked out of three high schools and I was 16 years old and I ended up getting a GED and didn't know what to do from there. Baruch College offered me an opportunity to continue my uh, academia and I honored that and I uh, became a merit scholar. I maintained the 4.0 GPO and uh, GPA and then I was able to then transfer to an Ivy League school and continue my career from there. So I'm very thankful to Baruch College and if Janet is here, she'll probably have me write some checks soon. Um, in addition, um, I was able to walk up this technology stack and become a CIO in New York City and, 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 and in Boston. And, uh, and then I started advising a lot of the investment firms, institutional investors, VCs in New York City. And uh, after that, in 2011, I got a phone call from Goldman Sachs. And that was the phone call that changed my life. They had an investment in a European company that they didn't know what, they, what, what was going on. They wanted me to take a look. So I took a look and found that and it was very interesting because it was Vienna, Austria. And the things that I knew about Vienna, Austria kind of made me a little hesitant to go at that point in time. But I decided to go, landed there, and I had a team of skinheads that were working for me, 25 skinheads, doing, they were all hackers, none of them had gone to school, but they had built a mobile payment system and they needed some assistance moving forward. So they embraced me as an individual from New York. Um, I came in in my normal suit, et cetera. They were in t-shirts, jeans, and combat boots with swastikas and tattoos all over. And I said, this is a very interesting situation. How is this going to work out? But <laughs> within 24 hours, they had asked me to be their CEO. And uh, so the next day, I came in with my hoodie, my jeans, and my Tim. So I had to keep it real, Brooklyn style. And you want me to go over here to the film? No problem. And we ended up growing that into the largest mobile payment system in Europe. And, uh, and then the blockchain developers called me and said, hey, why don't you roll out our new token on your platform to see if people would use it? I said, that was interesting. So even though we were the largest in Europe, me being in New York, I wanted to be bigger than that. So I went over to Silicon Valley and I touched Facebook, Visa, EA Sports, IM View, Zynga, all of the hot companies in Silicon Valley at the time and brought them all on the platform. And the thing just took off. So I left there, came back to New York, and said, hey, this is what the future looks like. And I failed. I couldn't get any of my private equity friends. No one wanted to invest in virtual currencies, et cetera, and, uh, except for one gentleman who was the chairman of LDJ, uh, David Drake. And uh, he said, hey, join my family office. I think this is going to work over time. And last year, middle of the summer, he went to Europe. I went to South America. I brought back one client. He brought back 50. I said, this is interesting. <laughs> Uh, last summer, so we raised one, two million dollars, and then by September, we had raised a hundred million dollars. I said, this is getting more interesting. From September to December, the companies we have brought in have raised over a billion dollars. And we said, maybe we have a business there. So since then, we've been doing more advisory stuff, this ICO fraud stuff that you see uh, Shabab present, the way we're doing analysis is some of the ways that we're trying to mitigate fraud, try to move forward in the industry, and uh, and I'm just happy that this is going to be the future. In addition to the technology stack and the financial stack, though, the one thing that I really want to focus on from my experience has been, this has been all about people. The human stack has been incredible. Blockchain has united me with skinheads, uh, people from around the world, in Asia, et cetera, and I never had any idea that any like this, anything like this would happen. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our panel, or I'll have the panel introduce themselves. I'll ask them some questions, and then I'll turn the floor over to you guys. So we'll start with Ed. How's that? Oh, great. Hi. I'm Ed McGuire. I'm a founder at Bluemont Partners, which is a 
uh, crypto and business advisory and also an insights partner at Momenta Partners, which is a uh, connected industry or an industrial IoT focused uh, advisory VC and executive search firm. And I've got a, got a Wall Street background. I was a, an equity analyst covering the software industry for about 15 years at Merrill Lynch and CLSA. And I've been uh, pretty much deep in crypto for, the, for about the past year. Okay, that's a tough act to follow. So Vikram Chopra, co-founder and CEO of Gift Genie. What Gift Genie really is is a shopping cart aggregator app powered by both blockchain and big data. As for myself, I don't like to call myself a serial entrepreneur. I'm a serial self-unemployed entrepreneur. So I love working with startups. I like blockchain and the technology, not because it's a technology, because there's a really good application for blockchain to solve real business problems in different industries. So our previous presenters talked about four major verticals. <coughs> I would say there's a big disruption with blockchain and retail, and happy to answer any questions regarding that. Wow, that's even a tougher act to follow. Ken Goodwin, <laughs> uh, how's everyone doing today? Ken Goodwin, Genesis Capital Markets, Senior Vice President in, uh, of Genesis Capital Markets. Genesis is a uh, boutique uh, Wall Street firm. Uh, we've actually advised on blockchain. Uh, we have several blockchain clients that we advise on. Uh, Hoku being one of them. We know this Bank X that you guys had on the screen. They're also client of ours as well as Nexo.io. Uh, we've also. That long? Is this better? I, I got a better idea. Yeah. <laughs> so I get the mic. Oh, I, <laughs> I like this idea. I like it better. Uh, so we, we advise several blockchain clients ourselves. Uh, we don't do as much as LDJ, but we're very specific as what we do. Our clients tend to be global, uh, both from Switzerland, of course, Asia. I have a Wall Street background myself. I'm a former central bank of the Federal Reserve. Also at the Bank of Japan, I'm a Mike Mansfield Fellow and an Aspen Institute Nakasone Scholar. So I spent some time at the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, and I've been around. I speak a lot on blockchain myself, blockchain economic forum, crypto world. I'm going to be speaking at a Propeller, Propellify in Hoboken uh, very soon on Thursday. Total humility. No background in finance. <laughs> uh, and I only learned about blockchain from Bill Davis beginning about eight months ago, but I think it's the most important thing that's ever happened in my life, that ever will happen in my life, and I want to work only in this field. I've been working for the past 20 years with emerging companies, helping them market to investors. I'm currently president of the New York chapter of Corrective Forum, which is the largest angel network in the world, as well as a business consultant. I describe myself as an innovator and entrepreneurship advisor. I'm working with an amazing blockchain company, which is an accelerator and a venture capital club based in Germany, headed by an American national, but quite global in its staffing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel Burstein, um, co-founder and CEO of Crypto Index LLC. Um, each of us, you can see, is coming from a certain angle to this subject. Uh, I have been for many years a head of investment strategy at HSBC, um, Leaper, Global Macro Investment Strategies, Goldman Sachs. So about two years ago, I recognized that what we have here, the topic of today, is a new economy. And of course, with a new economy comes a new market, new types of assets. So here it is a new alternative asset playground. So that's what attracted me as an investment strategist. And I function as a cryptocurrency investment strategist trying to understand uh, this market. And um, that's about a little bit. All right. Um, my name's uh, Roman Kravulich. Was uh, heavily involved with the Celsius Network ICO as a senior risk manager. Uh, Celsius is a crypto lending and borrowing platform, so enabling individuals to borrow fiat against crypto collateral, and on the other side, enabling coin lending to allow individuals to earn interest on their coin holdings. Uh, recently signed on as an advisor with AirPass, which is a uh, 
mobile payments solution, aiming to uh, launch its own uh, token shortly. Uh, and previously, uh, you know, worked at NASDAQ in a, in a risk management capacity. Uh, aside from that, personally, in crypto for about four years now, and you know, now just full time crypto, uh, both personally and professionally. So all in. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Great. So can we start with just talking a little bit about the ICO journey? So Vikram, you are running a company and you have an ICO in planning. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then can you uh, give a counter position or a little bit more information, uh, Roman, talk about what the Celsius ICO experience was like for the crowd? Okay. So I'll probably give a non-conventional answer to the whole ICO because right now I see almost like ICO has become another big buzzword. Almost like, hey, it's a really quick and easy way to raise money. And I'm going to say, no, you're absolutely wrong on that. Two years ago, maybe. The problem is, especially as of this year with Uncle Sam and SEC taking a look at it, as the presentation showed, right? A lot of those companies that successfully raised money are now struggling because they kind of like raise money almost in a glorified Ponzi scheme without any real business. So the trick with an ICO really is at the end of the day, like any investment opportunity, forget the buzzword ICO, crowdfunding, at the end of the day, you're raising money from a business. So before you, whether you're getting money from the general public or an institutional investor, what are the things you've built into your business, your team, your business, your model? So our two interns talked about the team. I would say with, the, with ICOs, your team's important, but in this case, more importantly, the blockchain or the technology. What are you biz building? What are you using blockchain for? What business problem is it solving? Is there really a value in offering a token or are you just doing that for a quick way to raise money? So my two cents is make sure you have a real business. Definitely have a good team. Try to have at least an MVP of your blockchain powered venture. So you've got something to take to market. Not that, hey, I'm raising money to build. No, no, make sure you've got something built. And I would say at least ensure you've raised at least a million dollars in a seed or series A round because an ICO is time consuming. At the very least, you're looking at anywhere between six months to a year. Most firms, some firms, will take things on a deferred fee, but at the very least, I would say set aside at least $200,000, low $100,000, $200,000 to do an ICO. So it's almost, that's what I said, right? So you plan for it. You make sure you have a running business, make sure you raise some money, you've got a product in place, and then plan towards an ICO. Now where an ICO is good is, when you're looking to do a large institutional Series B, Series C raise, an ICO allows you to raise a lot more money in a quicker pace, provided you've got all these basic things in place. Yeah, so kind of going off of that, uh, yeah, last summer was kind of ridiculous in the whole ICO space, and pretty much anyone could do an ICO and raise $100 million. Like Bancor had 100 something lines of code and they raised $120 million. That makes no sense at all. We've, uh, it just, yeah. We've moved away from that fortunately and we're finally starting to see a lot of real projects and you know, established uh, you know, individuals coming from finance and other industries looking to really uh, add and create real value uh, in a tokenized form. Um, so it's become a lot more competitive. Uh, investors have sort of all discovered who each other are. Uh, you know, they have little pools and groups. They all chat in on Telegram and they do some proper research, due diligence, etc. cetera. Um, so you can't just do a $100 million ICO out of nowhere. It takes a lot of uh, time and effort and a strong team uh, at this stage in the game. Uh, and, you know, a lot, there's, this, I would even say much more than $200,000 you should anticipate for between legal expenses and TGE and, you know, all the other pieces involved, um, capital introduction, et cetera. Uh, where, yeah, kind of, uh, where we're heading is hopefully, you know, in a, it's, it's it's positive for the for the industry. Um, we're going to see a lot of the noise uh, drop out, and hopefully, only the real projects will you know continue to survive. Excellent, Kenneth. Please, and and for you guys, you need to understand. Kenneth and I met in industry. 
uh, figuring out how to work together, et cetera, and found out in the midst of our discussion that he was also teaching a wealth management course here at Baruch. So I said, listen, if we're going to work together, you're going to have to show up on my panel at Baruch and put some work in for the community. So uh, he's here, and I'm excited about that. Ken, if you can talk a little bit about what you look for in investing in ICOs. He has contributed to a lot of money being raised in this space. And then when he's done, Eleanor, if you can talk about, and if you don't know about Eleanor, Eleanor, in her humility, she is a management consultant, but she is also the co-president of the largest angel investment network in the United States. And in the, she's a part of president of the New York chapter of the largest invest, angel investment network in the United States. And if you can talk a little bit about in some cases, why legacy investors are not investing in ICOs at this stage and what ICOs and blockchain companies need to do in order to attract that type of capital. Well, let's, let's skip. I, I want to add to these two gentlemen's uh, remark because you're absolutely right. There's a flight to quality uh, in the blockchain industry. That's what we've noticed in terms of the types of blockchain projects that are out there. They've gotten better which is a good thing. So you don't have the, the fluff that you had before. Think of it, the raises that were done in the initial coin offerings, uh, ICO stage, were done in different stages. So if you go back last year, go back in the summer, I call it stage one, which is that June to kind of July, August period, it was very easy to raise capital. Everyone, anyone could come up with an idea and get a large amount of quantity of funding done with an initial coin offering. So you didn't really need to have a strong management and a strong team in place, or an MVP in place, anything of that, of that nature. Then you had that kind of stage two period, which is that September to November period of time, where you still had that same ambiance that was still going on. Uh, November, December is very critical, because what happened to 715 was the period of time where you actually had the SEC coming out, the chairman Clayton of the SEC started talking about the notion that these tokens, these utilities tokens, would default back to security token. So the idea of everyone saying that we have a utility token, but now we're being classified as a security token brought a big fear in the marketplace. Also, December 15th and December 18th is critical because you go back to the CBOE and the CME futures. So a lot of people got to go back. That was the time when you had the futures that was being done in Bitcoin. So what it did was from the hedge fund side, it actually gave 30 months forward where the market played a little bit more differently, left out to January. So there was different stages that was actually happening in the blockchain space. Those who were involved, we talked about it a lot in the industry. Uh, that's really what was going on. Now, what we look for now is completely different than what we had before. We really emphasize management. The team concept and the gentleman who actually did the presentation was absolutely right. Team is so vital in terms of who is actually creating the projects themselves. Uh, whether they have the experience. The advisors are important. Uh, what you're finding now in terms of the advisors, we go into the point of the background of the advisors, uh, whether they've been in the industry for a long period of time, whether they actually understand the blockchain themselves, uh, whether they actually understand what is going on on the blockchain system. So we spend a lot of time uh, looking at the advisors, looking at the team, looking at the CEO, the CIO, the CTO, all those components that are being made of. Most importantly, we look at the design. The design is very critical, whether or not they actually have some actual use on a blockchain system. So we spend a lot of time looking at that to determine whether or not we're gonna work with them on the advisory side and whether or not we're gonna bring in the right investors on it. Uh, other than that, uh, we try to stick to the fundamentals. Uh, we, relationships is very important, whether they have the right communities in place, but we say relationships, meaning face-to-face, one-to-one relationship is very uh, vital, but also whether or not they build the right community uh, in the blockchain space. Well, we're all on the same page here. The single most important thing to any investor is the people. Can this, and are these the right people and do they have the right experience? Because everybody wants to make money. And if you can't execute, you're not gonna make money. It doesn't matter what a great product you've got if you can't implement it, it's not going to work. There are three stages to raising money. The first one is marketing to investors, selling the deal. The second one is surviving their due diligence. And the third one is closing the deal, negotiating the term sheet. And in the first one, what they, they really want to hear about your, 
your team, your market, your product, your competitive advantage, your business model, uh, and, and the ROI that's going to be in their exit. And then once they're sold, they're going to do diligence. And due diligence is all about risk management. And here's where you have to be absolutely tight that prove that your technology works. Prove that you have a valid design for your, uh, for your token. There are about 20 ways you can use a token. You don't have to do 20. You don't even have to do 10. But the more you do, the more resilient the model is going to be. And those <laughs> investors who know anything about blockchain know to look for the token design. Um, and there is huge disparity. There are huge numbers of investors that are still defining blockchain. And they're beginning their varying degrees of understanding and education as more and more of, of us are all going to different events and we're learning. Uh, the second issue after technology, of course, is the management and the team and the size of the market. And can this company, can you dominate a market? Uh, it, it's all very fine to have some hot new technology, but uh, what's, what's your problem? What, what the problem is that you're solving and how important is it to your, your users, your customers? Uh, how strong is your competition? What is your competitive advantage? And then <laughs> traditionally, you, the, the investor is looking for the exit. And you know, in traditional venture capital, you wait five to seven years. Here, with the token, you can liqu become liquid immediately. So you have a tremendous competitive advantage uh, <laughs> once you have a successful model. Because the, the traditional investor is no different from the new investor. It's all about capital. It's all about metrics and milestones and capital needs and sources that you're going to have enough money when you need it and that your business model is going to be capital efficient. Great. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle, can you embellish on this a little bit more, take it a little bit further from the regulatory piece to <coughs> excuse me, new products, uh, particularly the index model and how that fits into the space? And we'll follow that up with Ed talking about the next level of artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and how these things converge with the blockchain as well. Thank you, Bill. So I said I'm going to bring here, or I'm going to try to bring the crypto investment strategies point of view. So let's look at this as a market. Until now, we talk about ICOs. I said it is a market. And if it is a market, we need to understand which are the assets and how many asset types there are. Basically, it's not one market. It's two markets, completely, completely different, related. One is independent. The other is dependent on the other. The first category of the market are the protocols, networks, that allow the infrastructure to build new businesses, such as these ICOs that we've been speaking until now. For example, the Ethereum network um, and you know many more other protocols and networks. What they have besides protocols and networks, they also have a system to measure value in the network to allow to do transaction. And this is normally called a coin. So you have the Bitcoin, you have the Ripple coin, the Litecoin. So these are the coins, the networks, the protocols, the infrastructure. I'm looking over the window and I see scaffolding to build a build, uh, business. This is what the coins are in the crypto markets. The protocols, the networks, the infrastructures. And now the ICO that we've been speaking since the beginning, these are the new businesses which are using actually like the buildings that are being built behind those scaffoldings in this metaphor. Um, these are the new businesses who are using these infrastructures to build themselves. And of course, they are doing transactions. And for that, they're using tokens, which is a system of measuring value only within their business as opposed, say, to... Um, Ethereum, which actually is allowed to measure in transactions in all the businesses based on that network. So now, coins, tokens, two sectors of these markets, and this is what makes them. They have different relationship. Sometimes they diverge, sometimes they converge. Sometimes one is outperforming the other. They're behaving as just two totally different sectors. So now this is the market. The main question that I get every time I get to speak, and I've been doing a lot of family offices forums, is, yeah, yeah, you, you just say it's a market, but what's behind it? 
So what's behind it is a new economy, so we need to define this. We, what do you mean by a new economy? So let's define, you know, axiomatically a new economy by actually being a new model of doing transactions using a new type of infrastructure and or using a new type of measuring value. So internet, the infrastructure was, you know, the World Wide Web. The new way of doing transaction was through the internet. A new system of measuring value? No, we we're still paying at Amazon in dollars. Comes this side of the business, the crypto. Here, the, there's a new infrastructure. Now it's this decentralized, eliminating the middleman type of network infrastructure. But we also have a new way of measuring value because that needs to be decentralized as well. Hence, the coins and the tokens, good. So we got an economy, it's the fastest growing economy, double digits to potentially triple digit, whereas US goes, uh, grows at 3%, China 7 to 8%. It's the best emerging market that you have out there. So this is what the crypto markets are. So to, to follow on, on Bill stuff, so how do you invest in this stuff? So you just heard, you know, Bill is one of the largest venture capital firm, investor in ICO. You heard also the venture capital point of view. Is there anything else between venture capital to invest in ICOs, meaning in these new businesses, the second part of the market? Yes. So what we're seeing is we're seeing, and I'm going to give an example due to Bloomberg, we're seeing people realizing, hey, if this is a new market, then I can do macroeconomic investment strategies and I can bet on this market being the fastest growing of all the other markets that I have. So a few weeks ago, Soros Fund Management was announced, you know, was, there was a news in Bloomberg, so I'm just quoting Bloomberg. Soros Fund Management permissions its global macro trading desk to, tr to trade cryptocurrencies. So what does it mean? So this is different than venture capital investing in ICOs. This is actually allowing uh, a desk which is using the strategy called Global Macro, one of those hedge fund strategies that's betting on macroeconomic views and on economic kind of uh, uh, trends. It's recognizing that this market actually is an asset for a new type of global macro strategy, betting on the growth of it. They're not betting on ICOs, they're just using it as a global macro strategy. So that's one. And then you have hedge funds. You have a lot of hedge funds, 250, whatever, of which majority have been subpoenaed by ACC. Um, what they normally do is, I would say a lot of trying to put order in this by using statistic stuff like mean reversion, like some of them anecdotally start speaking that you know, I buy low and I sell high. So they're doing a lot of statistic arbitrage. They're trying to use machine learning, quantitative things. So, you know, that's another sector. And then there is the sector that we decided, uh, Crypto Index, the company that I created to dedicate ourselves to, which is Crypto Index Funds. It's a complicated market. We still don't understand it. You know, we think it's going up and one night, a Japanese lawyer, Nobuyuki Watanabe, sells 100 million in one go of Bitcoin and it crushes Bitcoin. And by the way, that's been happening for the last two weeks. It's been happening in December. So nobody can anticipate that. It, it is a moment in which the illusion that you can generate new returns as in alpha based on understanding where the market is going, at least short term, no way. So then one idea is, we know this is growing, we know this is new economy, let's get access to it and let's buy the entire market as a whole or at least in the most representative sector. And these are the crypto index funds. So perhaps now I should pass it to, <laughs> to Ed. Ed. 
Thank you. So what I'll do is I'm actually, uh, I'll step back a little bit from the specific specifics of investment and try to put a lot of this in, in context. So a lot of the work that I've done over the last uh, several years as, as an analyst has been to look at breakthrough technologies and, and uh, it, what people like to call disruptive innovations. But, you know, when we look around us, one of the uh, really amazing phenomena that's happening right now is we have uh, this convergence of some incredibly powerful technologies that are all benefiting from Moore's Law and Kumi's Law, which is the corollary for batteries. Essentially, you know, everything that has to do with information technology continues to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and more powerful. And what that does is that sets up potential for exponential growth. And uh, I don't know how many people have, have, are familiar with some of the work of uh, Ray Kurzweil and, and uh, Singularity University, but it's really helpful to put in perspective the, the, the way that change happens very quickly uh, when we, we deal with exponentials. I mean, that just uh, to give you a, uh, just a, a bit of um, perspective, you, know, you, could, you could take, when you start doubling uh, the, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's 16 steps to uh, a million, I think it is. Anyway, so I, <laughs> just, yeah. And when we, when we reach the, uh, when the numbers get big, um, it, think about, uh, and I'll just give you a, um, an example of, of the sequencing of the human genome, which took 15 years. After 14 years, it only, only about 3% had been done, and then all the rest happened in the last year. Uh, we're, we're starting to see all of these technologies really benefiting from these, uh, really from these common, um, common themes. So now, uh, what I find is uh, a really powerful combination uh, ahead of us is blockchain is, it's not new technology, but it's breakthrough technology. Um, the Internet of Things, the concept that many people have, have heard about is the idea that we connect the physical world to uh, information technology systems or data analytics systems that essentially allow us to see processes, patterns, and opportunities in ways that we haven't seen before. Artificial intelligence has been around for 30 years, but it's only since we've had uh, the, uh, these incredible advances in, in processing that have, that have lowered the cost of adoption, and, and this is pretty a pretty amazing statistic. Um, I was just speaking to Duncan Stewart, who actually writes the tech pr uh, predictions for Deloitte uh, for 2018. In the last two and a half years, the cost to deploy AI chips at corporations has declined a millionfold. I've, I've fell off my chair. It's like, and what uh, what's happened as well when you look at the ability of <coughs> Uh, of, of computers to recognize images. There's this ImageNet competition where the, actually the error rate has, is below 5%. So we've actually, we, so we've, we've had breakthroughs of you know, better than human uh, image recognition in AI. Uh, blockchain itself is, is a breakthrough. Uh, in the, with IoT, we've had really 15 years of you know, the beginning of the ex exponential growth, but every day we're getting Actually, a hunt, almost 100 devices are getting connected to the internet every second. And the progress has been relatively slow over the past few years, but here's, here's where, where we're going. Um, there's a, when you put all of these pieces together, you, you get to enable autonomous systems, like uh, systems of self-driving cars, uh, machines that, that can talk to each other and can uh, transfer information, payment information. Um, we also have, on, in parallel, uh, some enormous gains in, 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 uh, in ener clean energy. The, the, um, the, you know, the cost of solar uh, has dropped just un dramatically and it grows about, the I implementations grow about 44% uh, every year. So you put all these together, well, we're gonna be re, we need to redo all, you know, energy systems, the energy grid. Um, we're going to be dr driving. <laughs> we are maybe giving up our, our car keys and, and uh, just using uh, transportation as a service uh, to really to get around. And all these systems are going to be relying on uh, artificial intelligence to optimize uh, sales growth, improve operations, and minimize risk. You have the uh, the, the, this incredible 
instrumentation of the physical world to an extent that we've never ever seen before. And what blockchain has provided is this missing layer of trust you know, to be able to have devices talk to each other and authenticate each other without having to go through you know, a centralized system like a cloud system. We are moving away from a centralized, on an IT basis, a cloud mobile model where all the processing gets done in the cloud to this distributed <laughs> paradigm where a lot of the processing is being done at the edge. We're going to see uh, you know, AI processors on, uh, on edge devices. If you think about your automobile, that is the paradigm of where we're going to be going. And what blockchain is allowing us to do, and I do think the killer app of blockchain is currencies and it's tokenization, but it's allowing us now to measure and exchange value in ways that we've never been able to do before. So the trifecta of IoT, AI and blockchain is really world changing and actually uh, my friend Tony Siba has put a stake in the ground saying 2021 is the year that we're going to start to see transportation as a service take off and you can, uh, he's, he's been right for the last five years on every one of his predictions. So are you going to second that? I mean, you got to take accountability for that as well. I'll second that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to honor my earlier statement and, and when I said that this is about you. So instead of asking the panel tons of questions from, from my list, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And this is where, and you guys are probably a little too young to appreciate this, this is a Phil Donahue moment. This is when you would run through the crowd and pass the mic to the audience. Anyway, he was a dominant talk show host years ago. But since I'm not going to do that, I do have interns. And wait, hope you don't mind. Okay, there's one up there. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, does anyone have questions? Let's grab the mic and let's go. Hi. Um, having been spent many years myself in technology with a computer software company, this is very exciting stuff. I'm wondering if you see any political risk. Um, are countries going to give up their sovereignty over currencies <laughs> easily and without a fight um, to allow this kind of global currency markets to happen freely? <laughs> you take it? I'll take the first part and I know you guys can. I'll say, I'll put it differently, right? It's almost like a avalanche of it's almost like a snowball effect where more important than the government, the banking system, right? So the banking system, if they don't jump on this bandwagon, they're gonna lose, they're gonna be cut out. So that's why you're seeing the financial institutions in every major country and is banks are looking at how can we incorporate blockchain and that's why the likes of SC, Uncle Sam's getting involved because like, we want to regulate it. Why they want to regulate it? So they can help control it, so they can take advantage. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to take that a little bit differently, being a former central banker myself from the, the New York Fed and as well as the Bank of Japan. Um, I, I, I don't see it to be where governments are, are going to take over. I don't think that. I look at it a little bit more differently. Blockchain is about stakeholdership. So get back to the fundamentals of stakeholders, community, investors, people, government, corporations and so forth. So what you're finding now is the central government are trying to actually come up with regulations. Japan is a little bit more open to the blockchain system where if you do an ICO, you have to actually register with the Japan FSA, the Financial Service Authority. Uh, that's a little bit more different than let's say China, which outlined it, outlawed it. So China banned blockchain and crypto investing, uh, which is a little bit more different than let's say Singapore, which is a little bit more different than let's say uh, uh, China, a little bit different than, let's say, uh, France. So you're finding that you don't have this, uh, and we talked about this, this collaborative effort that needs to happen where countries are coming together and saying, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the blockchain system, we're gonna have the same regulations across the board. The Security Exchange Commission, um, you, have two, you have two major uh, regulation, regulators here in the US that's really looking at this. The Security Exchange Commission, and the CFTC, the Commodity Future Trading Corporation Commission. The CFTC takes the standpoint that the utility token is a commodity. The CSC, the Security Exchange Commission, takes the standpoint that it's a security. 
So what it does, it sends out the wrong communications to the public. That's a big issue in terms of central government and central bank is how you communicate very well to the public. What I like to see here in the U.S. is that the U.S. to fall back to what we did with Dodd-Frank. So when, when I was at the Fed, we developed the Term Asset Backed Liquidity Facility Program, which is known as TARP. So Dodd-Frank included the Security Exchange Commission. It included the Federal Reserve, the OCC. So what you had was you had this collaborative effort to say, hey, this is how we're gonna handle regulations here in the US. I think if you take that approach where the SEC works with, let's say, the, the Fed and the OCC, you're able to mitigate some risk, you're able to get that communication onto the public, and you're able to say, okay, if it's, a, if it's a security token, then it is a security token. If it's a utility token, then it is a utility token. But at least you know what you're dealing with. And that's what I hope to happen. I think it may go in that direction, because I think you're right about the banking industry. Uh, I think what's happening now is that banks have to be a part of it. Either if they don't, they're gonna have to later on. As you know, the banking system is very important for a lot of countries. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna see that gradually where you're gonna have one voice from different countries. Uh, I was just gonna add one little detail because you were alluding to a fight. And yes, there was a fight and there is still a fight. But the fight is taking an interesting turn. So you heard about China. So one side China restricts this space. On the other side, it was like three weeks ago or almost a month that the Chinese government funded blockchain fund of $1.7 billion was launched. So the idea is let's hit this guy and we take control of it. That's also the attitude in Russia. Russia is trying to create a uh, central kind of a Russia coin. You've seen also attempts in Venezuela using some petrol, kind of an oil-related type of coins. So the idea is, yes, I mean, we do not want to lose the control, but rather than just, uh, you know, being destructive and refusing this, we're actually going to embrace it. And by the way, that's going to become probably, I would like to invest in a fund that's backed by the Chinese government. It has $1.7 billion because it can only go up. Yeah? <laughs> Good. Now, but to a serious point, and let's go to a sort of less strict environment, Holland, like Netherlands a month ago, there was news from the Dutch Central Bank, Dutch Central Bank, that they actually tested and approved Ripple. Ripple is another coin, is another network, as kind of a, one of the most robust uh, kind of a payment system. So this is the Dutch Central Bank. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell you the Banco Santander and Rabobank, who are, of course, private banks, actually are putting Ripple wallets into their private clients' banking platform. But it's the Dutch Central Bank embracing this stuff. So here's another attitude. And then to the point that you mentioned about Japan, in Japan, Japan is a country that's very objective, very wise, and actually calculated that cryptocurrency trading added 0.3% to GDP last year. Do you know how much we're fighting here in US to get like one decimal up on this GDP? Uh, and just cryptocurrency trading in one year did it 0.3%. So you're seeing different approaches, different attitudes, and just the last one, and I'll stop here, uh, it typically starts with a fight, and then all these guys, they come back, they apologize, and they change their words. Christine Lagarde, the IMF head, criticized this blockchain stuff all the way in Davos, like, you know, like just the worst on the planet. Good. Two months ago, Christine Lagarde said that uh, cryptocurrencies can actually speed up transactions um, and settlements. They can actually make the system, make, they can make markets more efficient, speed up settlements. This is the same person that was criticizing it and so on and so on. So I'll better give the mic back to you guys. Pass it to Roman, pass it to Roman. Uh, just, this has already been talked on quite a bit, but the one last little quick point I'd like to add. Um, governments are realizing that, at least slowly, they're losing the domain over the last monopoly that they had, which was printing their own currency uh, within their own borders. And when Bitcoin came along, they lost that. 
Um, so, you know, to allude to the fight you've mentioned, they realize that they don't want to get left in the past. I mean, fiat currencies have come and gone, uh, you know, over centuries and millennia. Uh, they're getting involved, and you know, there are several sovereign wealth funds and other uh, governments that are looking to pick up and hedge their bets. So when a government buys Bitcoin, they don't buy a few thousand dollars, they buy a few billion dollars all at once. And that is happening right now. Uh, and aside from that, uh, the issue of identity or self-sovereign identity uh, kind of ties into this where um, you, know, you have uh, biometric passports, which is a standard that has been adopted by many countries uh, to you know, uh, essentially make travel, uh, you know, foreign travel, uh, you know, more seamless. Uh, if you can have a central or rather decentralized identity, uh, t you know, that governments are willing to, you know, adopt as a standard, then it, uh, it adds, you know, it, it increases their own uh, value proposition and makes them a more kind of favorable destination for companies to do business in. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're fighting for now, but s silently they're, you know, they're exploring it and picking up uh, coins along the way. Um, thank you very much. Another question that I wanted to ask is another group that you, many would anticipate would be fighting but are actually embracing it are the power utilities. You've had PG&E and Exelon and some others uh, speak out and embrace uh, blockchain as the next disruptive way that looking for ways to make it work for them. And we've seen a few actual practical applications, uh, companies like Vault Markets utilizing them for trading renewable energy certificates, and uh, Brooklyn Microgrid, pretty close to home, use it, utilizing it for uh, people to trade, you know, in essence, uh, conceptually, to you know, buy energy from, uh, from, from the uh, person with a solar panel across the street and whatnot. There are challenges to the implementation of these, right? There are challenges with respect to processing speed, with respect to the complexities of the different energy markets we have uh, within our country, where in essence you have many, uh, uh, and these these change these challenges are, are quite substantial. What what do you see as the uh, the next wave, and how soon do you see, and uh, what what do you see first of all as the greatest challenge to the broadening of implementations? practical implementations of taking it from idea to execution with blockchain technologically? And, and how long do you see these changes being overcome? What, what are the limiting factors to overcome those? I could, I could tell you, I've, I've done uh, quite a lot of work on, uh, on, on clean energy and, and, and the biggest challenge is regulatory. Uh, I mean, in the United States, trying to make changes to a grid is like dealing with 50 different, uh, 50 states, it's like 50 different countries because utilities are regulated. Uh, they do realize that, you know, what's, what's happening is that you know, oil is going away. And uh, as, as essentially uh, one of the amazing um, statistics now is that utility scale solar uh, implementations in Dubai and Mexico are now going in around two cents a kilowatt hour, which is lower than the lowest possible, the, the lowest alternative uh, that exists is five cents a kilowatt hour which for liquid natural gas, basically new production. This isn't, we're not necessarily phasing out existing production. Um, but what I would say is, you know, there, there's some really interesting pilots going on in Australia. Um, Power Ledger is, is, uh, has, has a, um, uh, has a project with a, um, essentially to connect a, uh, a city's uh, grid so that people can ch uh, charge their electric cars or sell power back into the grid. Um, that's, uh, that's currently in, in production. There's also um, Sonnen, which is a, dis a distribution company in Germany, is, is actually working with a, uh, they're working with a battery manufacturer to, uh, because one of the challenges that, that grids have is that uh, clean energy production doesn't follow a linear path, right? The sun's not always shining, but when the sun shines, solar panels 
create electricity, a lot of times there's excess. So that excess needs to be directed typically into storage, which is getting cheaper. Um, but that's, uh, but, but that's, a, that's a project that's happening right now. So if, I, if I'm going to put numbers on it, I'll tell you that it's not the technology, although the technology challenges are not insubstantial, uh, but it is, it's the human factor and it's, and it's, and it's regu regulatory and also refactoring the entire electrical grid. I think, I think it will happen, you know, within our lifetimes. I don't think we're going to see as great uh, changes in, you know, uh, in, in utility scale uh, in uh, emerging, uh, or sorry, in, in developed markets, bef really before the end of, of the next decade, really before 2030. However, I do think we're going to start to see a lot of you know, brand new, particularly uh, in emerging markets in India, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of uh, you know, brand new greenfield projects will start to utilize these technologies, and, the, and that in itself will start to accelerate adoption. Yes. Uh, thanks. And let me first tell you what a terrific panel this is. Uh, fabulous in, in all respects. Uh, so thank you very much for putting it together, hosting it. Um, so apart from all else, I'm uh, incredibly optimistic about uh, blockchain and what it pretends. But I want to go back to this question about currencies. I've been a student of monetary uh, theory and policy for the better part of uh, 30 years. Uh, historically, when currencies collapsed, uh, whether it was the Alcignat or the British pound, it wasn't an asymptotic drift uh, to worthlessness. It was sort of like my Russian friends recall in 98. You woke up in the morning, the shelves were full. Uh, later that night, the shelves were empty. Um, and so I wonder if, uh, given your very diverse backgrounds, uh, you would speak to how you see uh, this transitioning from a global uh, you know, dollar reserve uh, where we're saving these, these dishonored paper tickets. Um, to one which uh, really obsoletes their function. Uh, and I'd add in one spin, one of the gentlemen pointed out the last uh, monopoly of government was currency. Um, I would add that the other one is force. Uh, any government has a monopoly on force against its own people within its own borders. So this, this could potentially be you know, very optimistic and I could tell a bright sunny picture, uh, but it could also be very tumultuous and disruptive. Can I? Okay. Yeah, can I just take a little bit and then I'll pass it around? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is this working? Okay, so to explain this, we need to say something and I don't think was said today. So what is specific about cryptocurrencies? The specific stuff about them is that they are designed to have a limited supply and a mathematically controlled, algorithmically controlled rate of inflation. So let's take Bitcoins. Right now on the whole planet Earth, there are 17 million Bitcoins moving around. When Bitcoin was launched, it, the, the, um, the ceiling was set that there will not be more than 21 million Bitcoins. So now you understand what's happening because this is something that we can't relate to, you know, it didn't happen in the other currencies because every morning you woke up and they print another trillion dollars. Here, there will only be 21 million Bitcoins. So imagine now what I said, that that bank is gonna use this and that bank now is embracing these currencies and um, you have the institutions, pensions in Canada that actually that's true, actually. The first pension in the world to invest in Ethereum, Ontario Municipal Employee Retirement System. As this demand grows, because this is demand, serious demand, since there can only be only 21 million Bitcoins, and right now they're actually only 71 million, the value of this can go up and up and up to numbers that we can't even conceive, like 100,000, 150,000, etc. It's not because the economy is growing so fast. It's that combined with the fact that the currency supply is limited from the beginning. So that's one major difference between these currencies and the other. The other difference, and this would be my point, and I'll pass the mic around. The other difference is, to quote George Soros many, many years ago, in these very liquid currencies in general, in general, this was after the breaking of the Bank of England in 1992, but since 2000, in general, in the very liquid currencies, no player 
can actually control a currency. You can't actually smash a currency. That, that was in 1992, and it was done by Soros, actually. From now on, currencies are so liquid, and there's so many participants that, in general, they cannot be actually smashed by one participant. That's not the case with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are very, very vulnerable. And the reason for that is, is that there are some players, it's just the early days, the building of the microstructure. We call this a market. A market always has a microstructure of players. In these very early days, some players have access to unbelievable liquidity that it will take you months to accumulate. And if they decide to sell it, they can actually smash it. So I, you know, there's a big portion of the market that agrees that when that exchange in Japan, Mount Gox, collapsed, the fact that they are sitting on, they were sitting on $1.5 billion of Bitcoin, and the fact that the trustees were actually instructed to sell that, and trustees, they're no brokers, they're no market timers, they actually know that it's another week, I have to sell 5,000, and they do it stupidly, like in one go. In fact, there's a chart on internet how the Mount Gox sold this. You can see basically at a certain time of the night, there goes 8,000 bitcoins in one go. Stupid. You're actually destroying the value of your trustees. But this is this new structure that's maturing of new type of players. So this is what makes this market much more vulnerable. Now, that's the negative. That should be still OK if the demand, because you just heard from here, demand, progress, growth. That should actually push it back up. But there comes another innovation. And it's early days. That innovation works well in the late liquid days. OTC, over-the-counter trading. This is what is holding Bitcoin to the ground right now. Yeah. Bitcoin would have been at 15,000. It would have been at 15,000 right now, if not higher. But what's happening, all these new players, all these hedge funds that some of them, we use names from Bloomberg, I don't want to repeat them, and Rockefeller and all these guys, if they would go and they would buy in the market, like last year everybody was doing it, Bitcoin would be at 20,000. But, <laughs> but what they're doing is they're doing over-the-counter, meaning they're just uh, going to an over-the-counter broker that finds a large seller, you are a large buyer, that doesn't influence the price in the exchange. And although there's a lot of buying of Bitcoin, the price on the exchange stays unchanged. I actually agree with him. A hundred percent. Because you do have the wells out there. I mean, so everyone knows that the wells are sitting there. It is a cap in terms of the actual, uh, for Bitcoin, uh, which is the distinguishing factor. So you know, there's a, there's a, you're absolutely right in terms of the amount of Bitcoins that are out there, uh, the actual wells, what we call wells, individuals who've been holding on to cryptocurrencies for a long period of time, who knows when to buy and sell. We mentioned about the actual hedge funds, what happened on December 15th and December 18th. Uh, those are major players in the marketplace. But I think the question that this gentleman asked was whether the central government would actually fall into cryptocurrencies and whether or not that they were going, and we had this question that was posed to us at the Blockchain Economic Forum where we were arguing back and forth whether or not a central government was gonna use cryptocurrencies to be the monetary policy or monetary currency for that country. And the big question that we had was, it was you had to redefine what is a currency, right? So you had to go back into the fundamentals of cryptocurrency, right? When you look at cryptocurrency, I take I default back to, to Professor DeModen at NYU. I think he has the best definition for this. He said it's transaction and price. Those are the two things that these cryptocurrencies are doing. So it's transactional and it's pricing. And he said because it's doing that, it defaults back into a currency. That's his stance on it. That's not necessarily the stance of a central government. So the idea that central government is, is gonna do that, it may take some time. It may be a period of time when central government realizes that, hey, that we're gonna have to find a way to influence cryptocurrency, use cryptocurrency as a way to influence monetary policy. That's gonna be very, it's gonna be, may happen, 
It's happening slowly now, but it may happen over a period of time. I gradually see that's going on because I think what you have is the power of demand. So it falls back in the decentralized approach. As long as you have the demand in place, and as long as you place a value to it, then it's gonna have a transaction that's gonna cause a influence in the market system. And that's what's happening slowly over time. Maybe 10, 20 years, you may see many countries with different cryptocurrencies. You hopefully may see one cryptocurrency that may represent an entire sect of a, of a country, so multiple countries. That could possibly happen, but it's gonna be gradually over time and you're seeing that in different countries. Malta, for example, that's been doing it. Uh, you mentioned some other countries around the world that's been buying these cryptocurrencies, these crypto assets. They're doing it from that standpoint. Distinguishing between cryptocurrencies and blockchain system, two different things, right? So blockchain system, the technology that's flown, the cryptocurrency itself that works on a blockchain system. So distinguishing those two is very, very important. Excellent. This side of the room, I have a question. Yeah. Um, So um, Ethereum has already been hacked. Um, I've worked in the software industry long enough to know that every technology has bugs in it. Even if it's bug free, is there still some bugs in there? What gives you all the confidence that the uh, security of the underlying technology w it is, is uh, good enough to build entire economies on? Because if it's hacked, what this gentleman just asked over here, it crashes instantly. And we've already had one example. Um, you spoke of the Internet of Things. I just read a major North American casino was hacked through their internet-connected fish thermometer in their aquarium, got into their internal network, and downloaded their high rollers. List. So valuable data is being stolen. You know, I guess it's Willie Sutton, that's where the money is. What gives you all the confidence that this isn't gonna be hacked and bad things will happen? Um, I, I just wanna make an introduction to the real answer that I think someone here wants to give. And that introduction is a correction. We've been using this term cryptocurrency. Guess what? These are not currencies at all. In fact, you heard Kenneth using the term that I personally use, then it's more and more using the investment world. These are crypto assets. So remember, I said that there are two sides of the markets, the protocol networks. And what the protocols and networks, they have a value system to perform transactions. And that's implemented through a coin. So that works only in that network for the businesses who decide to build themselves on that network. So this is a very decentralized system of little coins used. Some of them are bigger than the other, but they're still working on a certain network for their transactions. They are not really meant to be currencies. They are just value systems to perform transactions within that protocol and network if you decide to build your business on that. So from here to call these things cryptocurrencies, no wonder you get George Soros in Davos telling you, oh, this is not a currency. If I pay you the salary in this lunchtime, you have half of your salary left. So they're not currencies, they're crypto assets. So we have to look at them as crypto assets. But I guess for security, Ed is the I, I, Yeah, I just have actually a, 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 quick, a quick answer to that. So um, the underlying Bitcoin protocol, the consensus protocol, uh, has actually never been hacked where there are always going to be uh, security vulnerabilities is uh, above the protocol layer and in the application layer. So uh, the reason that, that actually that I just heard Dark Trace talk about how they had discovered that, that hacked uh, fish tank thermometer. Listen, security is going to be, a, it's, an, it's, it's a never ending issue because these are human created systems that have human created flaws. You'll, all you, the best you can do is manage risks. It's the same thing uh, that you saw in enterprise software. Remember when Microsoft you know, got, uh, got slammed by viruses 20, uh, about 15 years ago? They took security very seriously. It's, it's, it's the same thing here. And, it's, and you just need really good auditing and uh, you know, just super, super careful diligence among the people who are, who are writing, particularly the applications. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add just one, uh, one more piece to that. Um, 
to uh, Ed's point, the underlying technologies have not been hacked yet. But quantum computing theoretically could make that possible within, and of course they don't exist yet, but say seven to ten years from now. Now there's certain projects who at least from their perspective, they believe they're building quantum resistant protocols. Uh, IOTA, for example, is one of these. They're using the Tangle, which is, I mean, I'm not from IOTA, so I can't explain it very well, but they believe, you know, it'll be a quantum resistant solution. Uh, and, you know, of course you can make revisions and updates to uh, the, the Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, code, et cetera. Uh, but more likely, and not to scare everyone here, but more likely I feel that 10 years from now, what we'll actually be using doesn't exist yet. Uh, so probably, or at least potentially, a lot of the current coins will just drop out. Uh, maybe even Bitcoin. Uh, does anyone still use AOL, right? Yeah, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thanks again for the panel. I do have uh, two questions, but I want to make two quick corrections uh, because of the nature of the audience here. So folks ought to know, first of all, from the software background, that what makes this truly amazing is actually it's a correlation of what happened in the 90s, which is open sourcing you know, certain assets like software, OK? So Bitcoin is open, really, for anyone to you know, fork is what we call it on GitHub. So it's not a cap on supply that's gonna limit anything because ultimately I think the CEO of B <coughs> BNEX also said there's gonna be millions of coins available. Uh, the second thing is in terms of um, consensus. Uh, this is the mechanism by which they validate transaction. There are very many consensus protocols, some in still development. So the system is quite safe and it's actually how digital transformation is really happening. I know a lot of you may hear in the big enterprise about digital transformation. So it's, it's the digital economy. So that's where things are tending anyway, whether it be Internet of Things, energy, smart grids, but that's where it's going. My question has to do in terms of where it's headed. There's a big trend between permission coins and those public networks. Gabriel spoke about the network, which is where the exchange of value happens. Okay, that's the trustless environment. So the question that was brought up is whether Ethereum itself is a security, which was pure nonsense, because those who know it know it's a virtual machine. And for it to do what it does, it uses what's called gas, which is how people put up you know, what it costs to do a transaction. So my question is, with enterprise Ethereum trending and all the banks in Ripple, do you guys see permission coin is where adoption is going to go? Because this is all about adoption. Um, the whole utopian idea behind cryptocurrency is that, you know, the unbanked can all of a sudden transact peer-to-peer -peer with one another, okay? But I don't see that being safe anymore because, as you discuss, on the government side, they're trying to uh, uh, make it illegal and yet adopt, and yet all this trading you hear about, this is all the uh, former finance people, whether it be hedge fund and whatnot, uh, putting all this sophisticated spin, but most of everything, including Ripple, is open source. So you could actually take Ripple, create your own bank, and do settlements. So my question is, uh, on the one hand, do you see permission tokens going to be the future, or do you still see those public networks expanding and becoming adopted on Main Street? The second question has to do with Europe, and specifically, uh, just GDPR, Okay, and I want to know, does that make Europe at a disadvantage compared to uh, this whole, and by the way, GDPR is, is general data protection regulation that was just passed um, before the Facebook breach and everything that was um, being worked on since 2014. 2012, in fact, was the first proposal. So it's now official May 25th, 2018, that in Europe, you have to adopt you know, procedures in-house to make sure people's data are protected. And, and since data on the blockchain is public, that most people don't know, people are afraid of money laundering. It's, it's, you can read every blog on the, on the Bitcoin ledger. So I think Bitcoin was just the original coin. It's not the most innovative coin today, but the fact is it's public. And so my question is, does it put Europe as a disadvantage with, with GDPR? 
And where do you see it going, whether it be permission chains or continuing the public networks? I want to try to answer with an example to the first question, because actually we have a case study, something that already happened, so rather than thinking and giving views, opinions. So 12 of the largest banks of the US, those that you see on the headlines criticizing bitcoins and cryptocurrencies, actually, privately, they got together and they built their own private blockchain. In fact, initially, they got together to build a system to do settlements between themselves and their clients. And they were looking at blockchain, they were looking at Ethereum, other type of things. In the end, it's called R3, by the way, the consortium of those 12 largest banks. The biggest name, they're probably there, R3. Um, they actually, in the end, decided to build a private blockchain, which is what you were alluding to, permission-based, a private blockchain, uh, which is only for themselves. Okay, so that's the solution they picked up. Uh, ideologically, that defeats the purpose of blockchain, because the whole blockchain is, let's decentralize. You just heard about creating trust and all that stuff. Forget about trust. Let's do it privately for ourselves. We do our little, you know, private uh, blockchain. Now, that seems to be, however, a solution, I think, for security. It improves security. What I don't know, and I should know, I'm going to go home and do this research, is how do they measure value in their private blockchain of the R3? Uh, because if it is a private blockchain, then they're not using any of those as you call them, open access currencies, so uh, cryptocurrencies. So they probably created some kind of an internal uh, system to measure that. But here's an example. Yes, we're going towards uh, private blockchain networks, and the excuse for that is creating more security. We'll take one more question. Thank you, Bill. Um, is there a problem with blockchain being a little slow? Because if you're doing uh, Bitcoin, you can only mine like a couple per second, and if that's the same technology behind the protocol like blockchain, won't that bring like Internet of Things to its knees if you're blockchain based? Now, certainly, if you're running, if you have a factory, you're taking a million samples a second of some factors. You know, you want to encrypt those perhaps, but put them in a distributed ledger under blockchain. Won't that take like centuries, well, years to take those million data points and uh, make them cryptographic secure on a distributed ledger, as opposed to encryption and you know signing them? So is blockchain really what we need there? Isn't that way too slow? Yeah, I, could, I could just quickly answer that by saying there's a lot of, that's, that's the, the precise problem that's driving a lot of the newer projects that are focused on concurrency like Archain and Cardano and, uh, and, and also part of the reason behind these uh, uh, IOTA and Hashgraph, which are uh, these uh, uh, directed acyclic graphs, which are just designed to be much faster and more scalable. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, even IOTA, I mean, I thought IOTA was looked really good, but then there's been a lot of pushback. No comment. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just want to say, if you're mining two bitcoins a second, please come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> What's it worth you? How much are you going to charge me for power? First of all, I'd like to thank Baruch for hosting us, for Scott, the team. This has been excellent. And Patty, please give us a hand. time to network, to chat with, and to get the questions that we couldn't get to in the bigger audience answer. Right? Thank you, everyone.